Anyways, so uh, the next talk uh, is on uh, using program synthesis for image uh, manipulation, and the talk is given by Celeste from University of Texas in Austin. Hi, um, thanks for that introduction. So um, I'm going to present this paper, ImageI Batch Image Processing Using Program Synthesis. So to explain what we mean by batch image editing, let's look at this example. Um, suppose that this person, Alice, has hundreds of photos from her daughter's school recital, and she would like to find all the images where her daughter is holding a violin and crop those images to contain just her daughter and the violin. A task like this is pretty easy if you have just a couple of images, but if you have hundreds like Alice does, it can be really time consuming and tedious. If Alice wants to automate her task, she doesn't have a lot of good options. Some popular image editing software like Photoshop and GIMP have support for batch image editing, but they only allow users to make simple edits like resizing or applying a filter to the entire image. That is, these tools don't allow users to make edits that are dependent on the, on the content of the image. Um, on the other hand, computer vision tools like Amazon Recognition and the Google Cloud Vision API are quite good at um, detecting objects in an image. Um, given an image, they can um, also identify certain interesting properties of objects, such as um, recognizing the same face across multiple images and um, detecting like whether a face is smiling or its approximate age. However, these tools don't offer support for image editing, let alone batch image processing. So to contend with this problem, we've developed this approach that combines the relative strengths of programmatic batch image processing and computer vision techniques. And I'll give an overview of how this approach works by explaining how Alice can automate her task. So first, Alice can perform a demonstration on a small subset of the images in her batch. In her case, this demonstration would involve finding just a couple of images where her daughter is playing violin and annotating, those image, annotating the objects in the images that are relevant to her task, namely her daughter and the violin. Those annotated images are then passed as the input to a program synthesizer that finds a program in a neurosymbolic image editing DSL matching the user's demonstration. Here, the synthesizer should output a program that, given an image from the school recital, returns a cropped version of that image featuring just Alice's daughter and the violin. After synthesizing a program, we apply that program to all the images in Alice's batch. She can then look through those edited images and check if they match her task. And if they don't, she can perform additional demonstrations that clarify that task. So this work has a few key contributions. The first is a neurosymbolic programming language that describes an assortment of image editing tasks using a neural object detector. The second is a novel algorithm that synthesizes programs in this DSL based on a user demonstration. And the third is our implementation of this approach, which we call ImageI. So let's talk about our image editing DSL, which expresses a broad class of image edits based on the content of an image. At the highest level, a program is comprised of a set of pairs of extractors and actions. Actions are image edits like blur, brighten, and crop and extractor, extractors specify what part of the image to apply that action to. Extractors are defined recursively. The base case extractor is the isPhi operator that returns all objects in an image for which the predicate phi evaluates to true. For instance, the extractor is object cat will return all the cat objects in an image. These operators are implemented using a neural object detector and encompass all objects and properties that this detector can identify. In our implementation, we use Amazon recognition. Extractors can be composed with set operators, namely complement, intersection, and union, as well as the constructs find and filter. Find and filter describe programs that involve positional attributes of the objects based on their relative locations in an image. For instance, this find program on the bottom left returns all person objects that are above violin objects, and this filter program on the bottom right returns all people objects that are contained inside of car objects. So the operators in RDSL can be composed to form complex programs like this one on the right. Um, this program finds all the cat objects that have a cat to their left and to their right and blurs those cat objects. So in this image, we would blur the two cat objects in the middle of the image. I'll now explain how our program synthesizer for the image editing DSL works. 
So the tricky part of synthesizing programs in RDSL is synthesizing the extractor in particular. So for the remainder of this talk, when I reference programs, I'm really talking about just the extractor portion. The synthesizer takes two images as input, the example image I and the version of that image annotated by the user O. The goal is to find a program P in our DSL such that P of I is equal to O. To generate candidate programs, our synthesizer performs top-down enumeration, starting with a partial program comprised of a single hole and iteratively filling that hole with constructs in our DSL. When we generate a candidate program that does not have any holes, we check whether its output on the input example image matches the user's demonstration. If it does, we return that program. Otherwise, we continue enumerating programs. To make synthesis more efficient in this domain, we use two novel pruning techniques represented here by the yellow rectangles. These techniques allow us to avoid searching futile parts of the program space, and I'll give some intuition as to how these techniques work. The first pruning technique is equivalence reduction, and this technique is based on the observation that many partial programs in our DSL are equivalent in accordance with basic properties of sets. So given a candidate program P, we can check whether P is equivalent to another program that we've already enumerated, and if it is, we can safely prune P. For instance, in this first example, we see that these two programs are equivalent since union is a commutative operation. We can also combine this technique with partial evaluation to make it more effective. For instance, in this second example, we have a partial program with complete subprograms, is smiling face, and is eyes open. Suppose that the example images, in the example images provided by the user, all of the smiling faces also have their eyes open. Then these two pro subprograms are observationally equivalent, and thus the overall program is equivalent to is smiling face by the set absorption law. Now I'll explain the second pruning technique, goal-directed reasoning. Recall that the synthesizer takes as input an image when the user has annotated the specific objects in the image that they wish to apply an action to. Let's call this set of objects the goal output of the program. Based on this goal output, we can under and over approximate the output that each subprogram of a partial program must have in order for the output of the overall program to be correct. Intuitively, the under approximation has all of the objects that the subprogram must output, and the over approximation has all the objects that the subprogram -pro can output. For instance, the children of a union operation can't output anything that its parent doesn't output. As an example, this partial program here on the right has the complete subprogram complement is object cat. This subprogram will output all the objects in the image that are not cats. So we can check if this output is consistent with this subprogram's goal output. And by consistent, we mean that the actual output is a superset of the under approximate goal output and a subset of the over approximate goal output. Put simply, we can check that a subprogram outputs all the objects it needs to and doesn't output any objects that it can't. If we find an inconsistency, in this case, if the over approximate goal output contains any cat out objects, we can safely prune this program. So we've implemented this algorithm as a tool called ImageEye, which supports, uh, which includes a graphical user interface. ImageEye supports image manipulation as well as image search, which I'll demonstrate in this video. So the user uploads a batch of images and then selects one or more images to annotate. In this case, suppose the user's task is to find all images that feature a person riding a bicycle. The user thus chooses to annotate this image. They save the annotation and then select filter images by annotation. On the right, they see a natural language explanation of the synthesized program along with a list of the images output by that program. The explanation images that have a person is too general. So they refine their search by annotating a second image where there's a person who isn't on a bicycle. After adding this negative example, they again select filter images by annotation. Now they have an explanation that reads images that have a person that is above a bicycle, which matches their task. To evaluate ImageEye, we have come up with a set of 50 image editing benchmarks inspired by real tasks that we've seen on image editing forums. Each task is in one of three domains, images from a wedding, images of receipts, and images that contain assorted objects. 
Here you can see a breakdown of these data sets as well as one example image from each data set on the right and one example task for each data set. Our experiment setup was as follows. For each benchmark, we first selected a single example image heuristically and annotated it in accordance with the ground truth program. We then asked ImageEye to synthesize a program. In the case where the program that ImageEye synthesized was not equivalent to the ground truth program, we added an additional example image and repeated this process until ImageEye synthesized the correct program. We had a timeout limit of 180 seconds. ImageEye's results on the benchmarks are as follows. Across all benchmarks, ImageEye could solve 48 out of the 50 tasks. The two failed tasks were the most complex in terms of AST size, and ImageEye timed out on these tasks. Among the successful tasks, the average synthesis time was about 15 seconds, while the median synthesis time was just over one second, and the average number of example images needed to synthesize the correct example was four. To offer a comparison point, we also tested our benchmarks using another enumerative synthesis tool called EU Solver. So in this graph, the X ref axis represents the difficulty of the synthesis tasks as measured by AST size. And as you can see, for the easier tasks, EU Solver performs almost as well as ImageEye. However, as the difficulty increases, there's a growing gap between the two tools. And overall, ImageEye can solve 14 more tasks than EU Solver. So I'll briefly summarize our evaluation. Across our 50 image editing benchmarks, ImageEye's median synthesis time is just over one second. ImageEye can solve 96% of our image editing benchmarks compared to 68% solved by a state-of-the-art synthesis tool. And finally, our pruning techniques significantly increase the effectiveness of our synthesis procedure. So thanks for listening, and I can take questions. Thank you, Celeste. Please go ahead and ask the questions. Hi, interesting talk. Um, my question is, uh, uh, have you considered ex expanding to videos and um, possibly making use of the fact that uh, adjacent video frames are similar and maybe incorporating that into your program? Yeah, so I think that trying to apply a similar technique to videos would be a really interesting problem, especially since videos have um, the temporal aspect in addition to the like positional aspect of images. Okay. Yeah, I, I would recommend like you know going uh, going that to, towards that as future work. Next, thank you. Hi, um, I'm curious if you're aware of um, this um, work called Viper GPT that came out of the machine learning community. So what they do is they prompt a large language model. They have these um, API calls that are made to image editing uh, kind of um, primitives. So crop, uh, blur, uh, various other things. And they also have object detectors. Uh, um, and um, so that's a completely different thing. Uh, but it's a full programming language. And it has loops and all manner of crazy things. So anything the language model generate goes, right? And it's the same mechanism where the user gives some kind of feedback, and then depending on that, you're either in business or not, right? Uh, how do you see the difference of something like that versus something like that that's uh, very carefully designed for a particular domain? Clearly, you have that advantage going on here, but you don't have the generalization. Uh, sorry, what is this called? It's called Viper GPT. OK, and this, you said it's a similar in that it. Um... They're also doing image editing, but they're not doing anything, uh, I mean, not to speak ill of a work, right? but they're, they're not particularly doing anything handcrafted. right? They're prompting a large language model, and they have a nice DSL for calling the right APIs. But there's no quote unquote clever synthesis algorithm. Sure. So how, how, how do you see this work as being, uh, let's say, more advantageous, apart from the fact that you're handcrafting it to a particular domain, and so you have that home ground advantage? How do I see this work as? Having an advantage, given that prompting a large language model can just give you easy generalization. Uh, so sorry, your question is how, <laughs> what's the? Uh, perhaps it's best to take this offline because there's okay, a line. Yeah, so, it's okay. Sorry for, if I'm misunderstanding. It's okay. It's probably a slightly unfair question to compare from another domain. But okay, it's okay. Thank you. Hi. Great talk. Uh, so in your DSL, 
where do the relationships in objects come from? In particular, you say find on, say, two objects, like find a person in a car. But in your first example, how does it know that you're not trying to say find a person in a violin? Um, so we use the um, bounding boxes of the objects. So, um, you know, if one bounding box is contained within another. Okay, so find is an and of the objects listed. It, there's no like uh, some sort of semantic relationship from, I don't know, something else from the. the it's just, it's based on the relationships between the bounding boxes. Okay, okay, thanks. Hi, great talk. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, in specific, with rela with, in relation to your pruning rules, so you mentioned that it's possible for you to prune stuff like, these two programs are gonna be equivalent, so I'm not gonna consider them, and you gave the example of the union. I was wondering if these rules for detecting equi equivalencies are pre-programmed, or you can generate sort of larger rules when you see them happen. Uh, like what, what sort of rules? Well, I guess detecting that two programs are gonna be equivalent. So the union rule is pretty straightforward to code. You just need to pattern match, but is there a capable, is your, is your sort of system capable of detecting these rules um, in general? Right, yeah, we just have a, a pre-set list of rewrite rules, but that would be, um, I think, an interesting thing to look Can into. Can I ask about how them. many rules there are? And like, uh, are these rules sort of straightforward rules, like the union rule, or is yeah, it something more complicated? they're very straightforward, you know, like rules that you would, like very basic rules of um, set equivalence. But yeah, that would be an interesting thing to learn. Okay, awesome, rules, thanks. Came up. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, as far as I understood, the evaluation process was kind of an iterative um, loop, human in the loop process and the average number of the interactions were, as I remember, four or five. Then did you try, like, I mean, does it work, like, if you initially just give four or five examples and it just works at one time? Um, yes, if that, yeah, you have the option to do the process iteratively or to annotate multiple images at once. Um, however, it's sort of, uh, an iterative process is likely easier since you're able to see sort of what's missing from your demonstration and um, annotate an image that addresses that issue specifically. So if you give like, if in an iterative process four or five was enough, but four or five wouldn't be sufficient if you just give it at one time? Um, yeah, it, it is really dependent upon um, the images that are annotated, um, which is, I think, perhaps a shortcoming. We're also working on incorporating um, like an active learning approach into this work so that it's sort of easier. The images for the user to annotate that are most useful are suggested to the user automatically. Okay, thank you. Hi, great talk, thanks. Um, I kind of have two related questions. You had mentioned that the synthesis seems like it can produce like a natural language description. And I was wondering, is that just like a hand-coded generation? Okay, it is. Um, yeah. But, and, sorry. Yeah, it's the natural language description that was in that demonstration is just like a translation from the program to a natural language. Cool. Um, and then maybe relatedly, if you're able to do that, would it, do you think it would be possible to have someone maybe describe more like what they want in almost that sort of language and then automate, kind of produce a program from that. To express what? Um, like what operation they want to do in a more like natural language like form, since you kind of have this like translation to natural language, something kind of that goes from natural language to that. Yeah, I think that would be useful and that's another thing we're looking into is incorporating like more like multimodal uh, like interaction in this, like allowing the user to additionally give natural language queries instead of just annotating images. Cool, thanks very much. All right. Yes, you have time for one very short question. Yes. So um, the example that you started with where um, this person's trying to get pictures of a daughter, uh, if your DSL doesn't have enough granularity, so if she has two daughters and they're both riding bicycles, you're out of luck, right? Uh, if she has two daughters? Yeah, she has two daughters, and she wants bicycle riding, but only for one daughter. Her DSL has to be specific enough. 
Uh, well, if she just annotated the images, like she would be able to annotate the images with the specific faces that she was interested in in that case. Uh, yes, and then you can distinguish between the daughters? Yeah. Because there's some kind of e equivalence going on between the faces that you're cropping out. Well, this is a cool capability of like um, vision tools like Amazon recognition is the ability to like identify specific faces across multiple images. Oh, I missed that aspect actually, thank you. Well, let's thank Celeste again.